Vivek, hi, good to have you with us. How have you been? Pleasure is all mine, my friend. This is awesome to be here. Yeah. You know, Vivek, I was I was looking forward to this conversation. I mean, I I say this more often, right? Uh, very often, and my team hates me for 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 saying this. Like, uh, their argument is that you know each session is very interesting session for you, right? But no, I think this session is genuinely very interesting in the sense that you know you've been an entrepreneur uh, who had an exit, uh, you know, chaired a very large organization, uh, right, in India, Asia, um, and you're back to uh, being an entrepreneur again, right? Uh, and while you do that, right. you simultaneously have been investing in many many startups right and there's a beautiful thesis that you have around it and there are there are there are a bunch of startups that you've looked at and uh, you know which are in the influencer space right and you've been investing in them you've been uh, you know building up your position as far as that bit is concerned right so it becomes an interesting conversation in that context right there are not a lot of people who can you know who can uh, you know play from both the sides right who understand the intricacies and expectations on both the sides right that's it becomes a very interesting conversation that then and i'm looking forward to this part I hope I make it interesting, my friend. But I will try my best. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, before we start talking about Profit Wheel, which is uh, you know your new initiative, right? Uh, and of course, your angel investing journey. I'd love you to run me through your uh, you know quick round of introduction. Will be helpful. Uh, you know, you've been there, right? Uh, and I'd love to know a little more about your know, that journey. Uh, and from there, we take it off. Okay, so I'll tell you how my entrepreneurship journey started. It's a story, very interesting story. It happened with my father. So I was ten years old, and he asked me. do you know the difference between a job and business mm-hmm. i was 10 years old i was wondering and thinking whether i'm going to get batting in the evening in the building cricket right or i was thinking he said like who's going to think of these philosophical questions <laughs> he answered the question he says that if you have a job you have to earn less than what you you have to spend less than what you make right you are in business you can spend a crore rupees a day but you have to just make sure that you earn more than that so i grew right. up thinking i'm going to be an entrepreneur because i'm going to spend a crore rupees a day <laughs> so it was the start of entrepreneurship for me so i left the family business and started communicate to which was right. a digital marketing company and i would say it was 14 years probably too early because right. pe- people did not have internet access and i was i wanted to do digital advertising right But i tell people like i went through a 14 years of almost like one was where i was called a genius and moron and genius and moron <laughs> In 2012, they called right. me genius, so I sold my company. Right. In the future, they call me a moron. At least I'll be a rich moron. <laughs> Interesting. It's been eight years uh, uh, with Densu from 2012 till 2020. Right. When I started on profit wheel journey from scratch again, right. It's a very interesting story how that came about. But I feel once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur, and I think all the networks are pretty used to. having these 30 40 acquisitions that happen every 4 5 year period and then after that 4 5 year period the acquisitions get over and you know entrepreneurs leave and start new companies or do something else right you know i think that that i think that itch doesn't go away right i think uh, the fact that you want to be at it you love you start loving the complexity right while i think a lot of people who are on a job want to kind of simplify it for themselves i think entrepreneurs start to sort of itch for and i completely understand where you're coming from right but you know wait tell me a little more about profit deal right i think i think it's that's you know profit as a service right i mean that's that's how you are uh, you know that's how you are sort of uh, you know that's the narrative right that you are uh, you know going with uh, in the market and, and and honestly you know at a distance it it seems very interesting right profit as a service right i mean how how beautiful can it be right a business owner right and somebody else driving profit to me right it can't get sweeter than that uh, so tell me a little more about uh, about profit deal. So see, I've been actually in the agency world for almost twenty years, right, Ashu? Sure. And what I've realized in that twenty years is that I think there are certain challenges. So you know, right. Guy Kawasaki talks about you start a company because you want to end something evil. Mm-hmm. So you know, he started Apple because he felt micro was evil. Or you want to start something because you want to make something great. You want to end good, right? So I think basically, if you ask me, I think there are certain challenges. Certain large problems that the agency world and the agency networks face, right? Uh, and Profit Wheel for us is an attempt to solve those challenges, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the challenges is the advertising world does not talk effectively with the marketing world, right? Or the advertising world in the new age of distribution, right. which the marketplaces, the social media, the influencer commerce, they have not got their act together for right. how to provide marketing intelligence and have a sniper approach, right? So right. how do you target? consumers from a sniper basis based on customer data of organizations right so, okay this is one problem which will require a suite of products to solve mm-hmm. i was very clear that second time around i want to build a product company i will right. not 
in the services company. So the competition yeah. should be Adobe's and the sales force of the world rather than being, you know, one more services company in the world. Right. So right. I was looking at someone that one of the most successful companies in India is Infosys. Uh, even though they are hundred billion dollars in market cap, right. they are two hundred fifty thousand people. And if you mm-hmm. take today, uh, Microsoft is two thousand billion dollars in market cap, just right. two dollars and hundred fifty thousand people. So if you take the next ten years, twenty years of India, right. I think there is this potential for product companies out of India, mm-hmm. which are slightly, significantly more riskier to sort of embark that journey of products. But I think it can be extremely rewarding. And you can move the needle and create the dent in the universe, as they call it, right? So, services companies to create a ten billion dollar company will need maybe one lakh people working for you, while you can create a ten billion dollar company in products with right. people working for you. So right. that change is something. So again, Profit Wheel is a SaaS ad tech platform which right. is going to be a suite of products in these three. Yeah. So this was the plainness, and our goal is as you know one of the things is that. Big Harry Edition's goal is that to basically take the advertising expense from the profit right. loss and make it a part of the balance sheet, where it becomes a cost of sale. So when you have an expense, right, it has to be below a certain budget. Right. When you make it a part of cost of sale. So you would not mind spending a billion dollars a month with me as long as I'm giving you ten billion dollars of sale. Right. Automatically, when you have a cost of sale, it's like my father saying that you want to spend a crore rupees a day, not a problem, as long as you earn more than that. Right. So if you take profit wheel is also the inspiration from what my father said. What made me an entrepreneur that if I can control the cost of sale for an organization, right, deliver them revenues and uh, sales based on a certain constraint they have, there would not be any budget for me. They can give me a billion dollars a month without any problem as long as I make sales for them and deliver them profit. Interesting. You know, Vivek. Uh, you know, I was I've, I've been looking at the website, right, and I've been I've been reading, of course, a lot of stuff which has been. Which is kind of mentioned about profit, right? And the way you're possibly cutting it, and I completely understand where you're coming from. I think this is something which is extremely relevant, right? In today's time, uh, because organizations need to optimize, right? Uh, thus, it becomes important to very clearly identify what are the possible areas of win, right? And I think that's essentially what you're what you're out there to solve, right? Now, one thing which kind of intrigues me, right, uh, is is where you where it mentions, right, uh, that you know, find profit field essentially helps you find some of the most profitable customers now. Now, when I start looking at that, right, and when I start as a business owner, for example, if I'm to sort of start seeing it, what happens is it becomes very difficult to understand, you know, my potential customers, right? Because not all the data is out there in the public domain. Something that you alluded to, right, in point that you made, right? Now, I have a very broad reference of what possibly exists, right? What are some of the key priority areas, right? Uh, COVID has been extremely, extremely, uh, you know, difficult for I think each one of us, right? Uh, for organizations, it's been all the more difficult, right? While of course there's a huge movement which has happened towards digital. Uh, you know, the product license cycles are going to change, right? That essentially means the way companies are planned, right, in terms of you know their outlays, budgets, right, are going to go through a huge disruption, right? They're not going to be as consistent. Product life cycles are going to be very, very uh, difficult, right? So while in that context, you know, profit wheel becomes very important, right? It also is extremely complicated, right, uh, to deliver. What are your thoughts about it? I mean, take me through the process and the journey of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, of, of a customer, right, uh, in in this particular relationship. Sure. So, Ashu, I think when I look back, I started Profit Wheel about maybe a year ago, a year or two right. months ago, and uh, almost like when we started off, we said that we want to build a company that will focus on customer data, right? So we are customer data led commerce company we help right. in commerce using their own customer data right even i would say that direct to consumer companies obviously have a lot more data about their customers mm-hmm. but even other companies right covid has made them realize that if they don't have first party data right they can suddenly go from 100 crores of revenue to zero sure. because if dealers and distributors and stockists are the only people who have your data then you're going to end up in trouble in fact, I've invested in a company, so I do angel investments, where one of the companies it basically does QR codes, right? Brands, right. So it just allows you to collect first party data, right? On behalf. So they work with distillery kind of companies, and they help them collect first party data. Right. So once you have first party data, the benefit is that today marketing intelligence can come from Facebook, from Instagram, from Google, from Bark, from all right. platforms, 
from so many sources that right. you can get pretty good sort of actionable insights about your customers. So let me take an example. Let's right. take let's take a real estate example, right? Mm-hmm. There are thousand people who fill up a lead. Right. There are hundred people who come for a site visit, and there are ten people who buy. Right. In a way, there is three cohorts. There mm-hmm. is a high value customer who's buying. Right. There is a mid value customer who comes for a site visit, mm-hmm. and then there is a low value customer who just visits a lead. Right. What if I can give you insights uh, within seconds about these three cohorts? Interesting. I knew that the high value customers have a lot of affinity towards, in, let's say, sports or thrill seeking. Right. The mid value customers have a lot of affinity towards home decor. Right. Low customers have, you know, affinity towards music because everybody has affinity towards music. Right. Now, when you are actually doing your creative. you can do specialized creative which is like still seeking lead for high value customers right. you can content which would be more attuned towards your high value customers mm-hmm. you can actually now do media planning and reach out to customers who basically are high value customers so right. now the biggest benefit in this is that 20% of the customers generally end up giving you 200% of the profits right so in beyond the pareto rule of 80 20 mm-hmm. so now what happens is that this sniper base approach of targeting high value customers actually is not very publisher friendly nor is it very agency <laughs> it's a right. tech product but i generally believe that if you are able to deliver really great value to clients right. and keep the profits then they will invest a lot more uh on advertising right so i think in the longer run it will benefit the whole ecosystem because if you take you know in the 20 years ago 30 years ago ago in the old distribution age you know only 10 12% of your budget was spent on advertising now in direct right. you know brands because you don't have to pay that acquisition budget every time you just pay for it once people are spending 50 to 70% of the budget towards the acquisition So that means the whole industry is going to grow significantly right. in the few years in the new distribution age, and I think that's a huge opportunity for the ad tech world and the martech world. And I think the product companies allow you to create a globally scaled company very, very quickly. Uh, right. What a services company would be, right? When I sold Communicate Two, we remained an agency. We became we were the largest right. agency in the country, but it was still limited to India and. probably 60% of our customers came from mumbai because i was based in mumbai right <laughs> right so, but now what happens is profit wheel is already in four countries we are acquiring clients all over the world and right. the ability to go global quickly is much easier if you're a product company very interesting you know i want to understand the commercial model right and when i when i'm actually sort of listening to you when i'm talking to you right in my mind there is another model going in right which is uh, you know agency as a vc right uh, and we have a few examples of that right where uh, you know there are funds that have been set up uh, you know and some of these funds are actually going in and participating in these companies where they're saying that listen we will are 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 also are, we are uh, participating with you right our neck is also on the line plus that plus it becomes important that we participate right you chosen a very different path right uh, vis-a-vis that one uh, and of course uh, and i understand where you are coming from uh, right uh, it's a product approach it's not necessarily a funding led approach right so some of the others are are taking the process but what does the commercial engagement play like i mean is this like a product uh is this like a saas level play uh, or or is there something which is done in a different way right where uh, you know you have a take in the in the profitability that you help that uh, organization company increase achieve right uh, is there a is there a part in that uh, do you sort of have so ajo i am a firm believer of uh, uh, writing of jim collins right and right. good to great book talks about firing bullets right and- when your bullet hit the target you throw the can ball so <laughs> what we've seen over the last few months is that we are approaching our clients with different models right. one model is you pay us a fixed saas fee mm-hmm. and other model is they pay us there are certain insights we provide to them so they every time they they sort of create a run for the insights they pay us right. a certain fee for the right. insight we exploring they give us a percentage of sales right uh, then we are exploring a model where they give us a percentage of the incremental profits we're delivering to them based on the margin they have all right i think what did direct to consumer sector is that the entire cycle of sales is completed mm-hmm. online right but i feel that if you want to build a really scaled global company mm-hmm. i think a fixed saas fee plus some kind of variable uh, would be a model that i think we getting the most amount of traction 
So I feel that if you can charge a fixed SaaS fee and right. then charge a small percentage of sales, I think that model is something that seems to be more scalable than the others. But again, one end we are working with direct lines, but we're also working with uh, agencies who are using our SaaS products for servicing their own clients. So they pay us a fixed fee per month. Right. And we are able to increase the revenues and save the number of man hours they spend on servicing the client. So right. um, we've actually launched our products last only a month ago. Right. So we have six, seven different pilots going on with different companies. <laughs> right. Exploring. I said, like, you know, at this point of time, I just want every customer of ours to pay something, right? So as long as right. they pay, we're okay with it. Uh, what we want to do first thing is that deliver them value. Right. What I mean is that once you deliver anybody value, then taking a share of the value is never difficult. I agree. I agree. You know, Vivek, I think I think I completely understand where you're coming from. I think these are early days, right? Uh, I think a lot of those models, a lot of those models are going to scale right, right? And I think next time when we have this conversation, possibly you know uh, a couple of months down the line, I'm sure that there's going to be a little more clarity, right? Uh, and I think uh, uh, you know, uh, I think there is possibly going to be industry-wise thesis as well, right? Uh, given that you know you're kind of now operating in many many markets, right? And at least the aspiration is there. Uh, and I'd love to sort of I'd, I'd wait for that occasion, right? Where we have a little more clarity on that one. Vivek, I'm going to move to a, you know, the, the second half of our conversation, which is a, which is also a very interesting conversation. Right? Uh, uh, you know, it's around angel investing. Now, what has happened is that COVID has kind of, you know, fast-tracked us as an economy, right? Something that I alluded to in, in, in one of my earlier questions, right? Um, we are essentially now becoming one large market. I mean, we've been talked about it, uh, right, uh, at a very tangential level, right? One large market, last billion people market, right? But we've never been a large uh, billion people market, right? We've been a combination of many, many markets, right? Uh, uh, coupled together, right? Uh, we operated many days, right? COVID has been an unreal situation because, you know, it's moved us to think alike, right? Uh, it literally, you know, all of us were locked in a certain setting where we were, all of us were consuming from the same screen, right? So behavioral uh, tendencies became predictable, right? And I think we've seen uh, a huge resurrection in confidence, right? Uh, with participation coming from, a lot of global VCs coming in and funding our company, right? Uh, and there's a huge tendency change. As an angel investor, uh, right? And as a founder, I mean, as a founder, you of course answer this, right? As an angel investor, how do you read this entire situation, right? Uh, how excited are you, uh, you know, about the change and the transition that we're going through uh, in the economy? So the way I look at it, Ashu, I think if you take what happened in Silicon Valley 20 years ago, right. happened in China 10 years ago, uh -huh. in India today. So the right. next few years in India, we're going to see these tens of $100 billion companies hopefully being created, right. which means lakhs of $100 million companies and probably even more than that of these $10 million kind of companies, right? So right. Uh, there are a lot of things that are changing for the... So COVID is just one of the tailwinds that we got. But basically, if you look at it, there's a lot more product entrepreneurs in the country Right. There's a lot more capital available to people who have sold their companies and, you know, they have capital, which they're putting in and a lot of uh, things that have happened in China because of which the capital is going to shift to India. Right. But I'm very excited about this whole space of angel investing because I think what's going to happen is that the way I look at it, right, the my first book that I read was this book called uh, Angel Investing by David Rose. Right. And one of the things that stuck with me from the first chapter onwards was that if you want to do angel investing, you don't invest in one, two companies. Right. You don't invest in 30, 40, 50 companies, right? You will not be able to do justice to angel investing and you will not get the CAGR they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that was very obvious, which I've had conversations with a lot of other angel investors that I know, angel investing is not done from a primary purpose of ROI. Probably not the best asset <laughs> from our right. point of view alone, right? But angel investing does a lot of things for you, uh, and it actually gives you a lot more benefits. So, first benefit right. is that I understand a lot more about different industries. Right. When I've invested in a lithium ion battery management manufacturing company, or I've invested in a MRI machine manufacturing mm -hmm. in California, or a, a platform in Estonia, or influencer. Right. In UK, or a company that does yoga training, or a celebrity school which teaches is a copy very similar to masterclass.com. Right. right. Every single one of those investments have taught me a lot more about the industry. Right. I think meeting these entrepreneurs completely energizes me because right. 
when I look at it, I look at myself, okay, I'm taking a risk. You know, I've left an MNC job, <laughs> embarking on this thing again. And then I meet this entrepreneur who's right. done everything and he's given it all up. Right. Taking a risk, which is tenfold more than me. Suddenly, you know, it energizes me that, you know, if this guy can do this, so can I, right? So right. you learn a lot from entrepreneurs. Uh, thirdly, I've seen is that some of these companies are doing extremely well right now. Mm-hmm. But my only fear is that uh, I till the time the you know money hits the bank, they have this saying in Hindi, right? This is the gode bhakte hai to gade bhi bhakte hai. <laughs> right now, right. everything is running, right? I don't know yeah. which of them are going to last <laughs> uh, till the end of the race and actually end up delivering capital. Right. It's a lot of it's a phenomenal journey. These last uh, few years have been very very exciting. Uh, mm-hmm. You mentioned the influencer space, so I'll tell you what one of my investment theses is. I, I I have named it as a roulette table strategy. Right. So how the strategy works is that you go to a casino, there is a roulette table. They have odds of 36, 37. Right. You know, on, when you bet on a certain number. And then you look at this table and you find something very unique on this table. This table has only 10 slots. Right. Now you're going to get odds of 37 and there are only 10 slots. So you put it anywhere. So it'll be idiotic to miss out one slot. You put it on all the 10 slots because right. seven times mil level hai. <laughs> So then what I do is that, okay, my best company, which I feel is going to make the most amount of money, which right. is slot number six, usme mein jo hai, I'll put in 75 lakhs. Right. In slot number 13, or let's say nine, I will put in 50 lakhs. Right. Then I'll put in 25 lakhs. And then last four, five companies, which I'm not sure are going to work, but they're still in that same roulette table, like influencer space. Right. I'll 10 lakh rupees each. If the worst of that companies, which I thought is not going to make it, mm-hmm. actually the ball stops there. I make 37 right. times, I recover all my monies and make some. Right? <laughs> if it comes on my 75 lakh rupee investment, then I make 37 times of 75 lakhs, right? So then I'm obviously sitting pretty. But right. I feel that till the time the ball does not fly off and go off the table and the influencer itself doesn't remain and Facebook closes down and there is no creator economy left, at least something will work, right? Right. So that's my philosophy about taking larger bets on the industry that I'm really confident of, but also right. taking smaller bets on companies that I'm not sure are going to work, but they're only 10 slots, right? It's I'd rather bet on all the 10 companies rather than bet on one company. Right. So that's what I've done in influencer space. And I generally believe that influencer space is going to be, my take is, is going to be 10x of advertising. In fact, in profit, right. really, the one of the products that we're building, which we are very, very excited about is, what it does is it takes your high value customer. Right. And then what it does is it analyzes what audience they are. And then uh-huh. we take influencers and we analyze their audiences. Right. And we create this almost like a forced ranking that if you are right. to work with 100 influencers, which influencers you should work with in how what order. Right. So automatically we can guide your influencer strategy based on your first party data. And the value it will give you, right? Because right. influencers can give you commerce. Right. So when only one to two percent of your advertising budget of GDP is spent on advertising, right? But influencer is like a cost of sale, is influencer commerce. So you can spend almost 10 percent of your budget, right? Uh, from a sale point of view, right? So that's 10x of advertising, right? Actually, the market itself is 700 billion dollars. So imagine <laughs> what 10 percent, 10 times of that would be, right? It's seven trillion. Right. So the influencer space, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Let me give you one example, right? Times sure. of India has readership of let's say 15 million in circulation right. of 60 million, right? So 15 million reach hai. Time is India, total revenue is about 7,000 crores. Maybe right. of that will be the English language newspaper. So that's how much. That's still only two, 3,000 crores they're getting for 15 million reach. Right. So one influencer has 100 million reach. He doesn't even make 10 crore rupees. Right. The fact of the matter is, if, if you look at it, you fast forward the next 10 years, the only difference is that if you take California where Uber was launched, Right. It, Uber should not be so big because uh, even if it takes 50% of taxi market, still right. is not justified. But taxi market was $50 million and taxi market in two years time became 40 million, but Uber mm-hmm. became 200 million. Right. So it created $190 million of additional new market that did not exist earlier. It just took 10 right. million from taxi. Same way the influencer economy and the creator economy is going to create this new market, which would be in trillions of dollars without taking money from advertising. It's right. just create this new market 
So I'm betting it all on this new market and I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Hopefully, <laughs> few months okay. Down the line, we talk again. I say, yeah, yeah, it worked out. My celebrity school became <laughs> valuable. Like master classes today, valued at two and a half billion dollars, right? Right. It's, as an ed tech company that just teaches you things from celebrities, it's right. two and a half billion dollars today. Right. Interesting. But Vivek, don't you think that this has to be more comprehensive process, right? Uh, I mean, you know, as we're becoming, I think we are in a very early phase, right? I, and I call it a very preliminary formative phase, right, of of our economy, right? Uh, I mean, it's only taken off in, say, post-2016, right, right? Uh, or 17, uh, around the time Geo came in, right? Data became cheap, people started to drop it, right? But I think now we are now, you know, given that COVID has happened, given that there is a huge amount of digital education which is going to happen, right? Our ability to question is going to be higher, right? And that essentially means, you know, uh, at least I have a thesis. And when you're especially doing content, right? Or even an influencer, for example, doing a content, right? Or the creator's economy that you're talking about, right? In a content space, there's nothing called affinity, right? More is more. If I'm interested in a topic, I'm going to go and dig further, right? If it's about a celeb, I'm going to go and dig further. If it's science, I'm going to go and dig further, right? Don't you think it'll have to be supported by a lot more? Uh, it cannot be a tangential uh, 50, 70 second, a couple of minutes of a video, right? Where you're plugging in a product. It will have to be more meaningful than that, more deeper than that. So it will not only be limited to an influence influencer way, but many other things which, which follow it up uh, or which firm it up in the consumer's mind in the process. Uh, the other offshoot of that question is, I mean, you highlighted about Times of India, right? What is possibly the way I look at it uh, is that because there is just so much of clutter which is happening, right? I mean, I mean, the fact of the matter is we're just flipping screens, right? Every single in, in, instance of interaction is 50, 60 videos, right? And that's essentially, uh, you know, what, what's happening with us, right? Don't you think credible brands will start commanding a premium because there's a little more effort research which is going into putting that information out, right? What is your sense of it, right? It's an interesting phase, right? There are not clear answers, right? But how do you cut it, right? Given that, you know, you have, uh, you know, you've made these bets, right? right? Uh, in the influencer space, how are you looking at more credible information play, right? Uh, uh, that ecosystem. Yeah. So see, the way I look at it is very simple, right? That sure. I'm not betting on that particular influencer. Mm -hmm. I'm betting on the infrastructure. Right. You know, service the influencer. So let me, for example, let's say celebrity school is an example, right? Sure. We, what I'm betting on is that people learn things from the age of zero to 25 right. in a job. Sure. And then they learn from the age of 25 to 70, mm -hmm. either keep their job right. or for wellness or for entertainment or for right. Things, right. So I feel if the zero to 25 market is $6 trillion, right. 25 to 70 market actually is not even $100 billion. But the 25 to 70 market has a lot of propensity to pay. Because they have a lot of propensity to pay, they will be investing those monies for learning things. Now, whether right. it's learning cooking from Vikas Khanna and Ranveer Bra, or learning singing from Shan or photography from Dabu Ratnani, or learning how to be a Miss India from Mania Singh, right? Doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, there is going to be some people who are going to invest in that money. It's like I've been a follower of Masterclass for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. As long as I'm betting on 100 celebrities, right. regional languages mm -hmm. across the globe, right? right. And I'm taking Vikas Kanna's cuisine, Indian cuisine cooking classes and making it translate right. to Japanese and selling in Japan. So mm -hmm. I'm taking local celebrities and regional languages. Interesting. Right? So now, now credibility comes from the celebrity itself, right? If there is right. someone teaching you singing or Vikas Kanna who's a Michelin Shah chef teaching cooking, credibility is coming automatically, right? right. I don't need endorsement of Times of India for Vikas Kanna or Anvi Blar to get credibility, right? Right. Automatically, right? Now, having said that, I do agree with you for specific news kind of things, right? right. So if you take consumption of news, right? Hasn't mm -hmm. that uh, consumption pattern changed, Right. Right. Today, our children don't read newspapers. Sure. Consuming news 20 times in a day. Mm -hmm. right? if, if I wait for the paper to come the next day, I've already lost what has happened today. Right? right. Now what happens is in that kind of scenario, credibility can come from hundreds of sources. Right. Sure. So it could be a tweet from Wall Street Journal. It could be a journalist that I trust. It could be somebody who's explaining a certain concept. So the right. talks about blockchain. So a person who's a CEO of like I know five people who are authorities in advertising, right? right? I trust them more than I would trust a newspaper also because at the end of the day, that person I understand is one of the best digital marketing guys in the world. I trust him, right? So if Bill Hunt says something about search, right? 
I will trust him more. Most people right. have not heard of Bill Hunt, but I have, and I know he is the guru for SEO in the world. So right. I trust him, right? So now what happens is that if there are five hundred people who have credibility, and they are influencers of their own rights, they will influence me, and they'll give me news that I need. If fifty out of those five hundred people share something, then that something must be important. Right. I don't care whether it's being covered in traditional media or not. Interesting. Right? So my take on influencers is that. it is not that every single influencer who has so let's say i'll give you an example right, right. a influencer in canada called shane parish he right. comes for for ham street mm-hmm. his blog i pay about 100 dollars a year for that blog right he has 10000 people who are paying him 100 dollars a year right he also does a decision making course mm-hmm. which teaches you how to take decisions right right i paid 500 dollars for that course and now he's increased the price to 700 dollars The 12 video course, right? Every week he just gives you a video. You see it. This is your right. decision making. So in my mind, right, he is an influencer for decision making. Right. He's an influencer for something else. So the way I look at it is this creator economy, right? What is doing is that there are fifty thousand things we want to learn. There are fifty thousand right. we want to know about, and there are fifty thousand people who are specialist in that one thing. Right. So there is a possibility that. If I want to learn anything about decision making, I will not wait for an article to come out in a traditional newspaper. I'll go to Shane Parrish's blog, and that's enough for me to know about decision making because there isn't a more bigger authority for decision making than Shane Parrish. Right. I think I think what you're talking about is democratized learning, and I think that's essentially what you are. You know, through this possibly the route that you've taken, I think that's essentially what you are eventually getting to. Right. And I think I think I. I kind of, I kind of love that narrative, right? That you uh, put out, Vivek. Uh, Vivek, I'm going to uh, a very, very important, interesting question, right? Uh, now, you know, you've been an entrepreneur, right? You've been on the driver's seat, uh, and and you know, investing is something, uh, and, and you know, and, and they classically say, right? You know, it's it's like fishing, right? Uh, you know, you you do the prep, uh, right? You put your, uh, you know, with your fishing rod, you're out there, right? And just and, and you know once you've done that basic you know you just have to wait for the result to sort of come through right now for an entrepreneur it's very difficult especially when you've been an entrepreneur who has an exit right because there are so many things you know you're just in a very different you're coming from a very different environment right that's an environment of decision taking decisions you know course correcting very quickly moving uh changing things on the fly right there is a lot of that dynamism which is which is uh you know which which becomes a part of you right as an individual. How difficult is it, right? When you are when you are sort of operating as an angel investor, right? When you are funding these companies, how difficult is it to contain yourself, right? To contain that enthusiasm and giving the founders the space to play, right? Uh, I would love to understand that, right? Because that's usually very difficult. It's a wonderful question, Ashu, and I am still struggling with it, right? I've done twenty <laughs> investments and I'm still struggle with it. So right. early days when I was investing, right, I was making one big mistake. The mistake I was sure. doing was that I would fund a company. because right. i thought and i could almost visualize what i could do with the company right and that was a disaster so what <laughs> you have to realize is that it's his company he is the entrepreneur right. or she is the entrepreneur she has to decide what she is going to do with the company right so what i realize is there are two things that entrepreneurs appreciate from them, right and so first of all i explain to them that it's a it's a pull relationship so what it means right. is if you want me to help you with something you right. have to ask me for it Right. I'm not going to ask you for financials. I'm not going to ask you for things. I'm not going to right. follow up with you. So it's never going to be a push relationship with you. You want something from me? You basically ask me, and I'll try to help you. Right. Two things that I've seen in all entrepreneurs appreciate. One is if you can help them sell, right? So any time you can help that guy sell and introduce him to somebody who's going to buy from that guy, then what happens is even if it's a push relationship, they love it, right? So right. you can help your entrepreneur to make a sale. they love it second right. thing is nowadays everybody needs more monies because the <laughs> ambitions are global so if you can connect them to investors who will put in monies in them right. so actually i just do two things for so i come very early ashu so right. I, some companies i've come in at like i've invested 25 lakh rupees and taken 10% stake in the company before right. the company started right. and like some of my companies right now raised at 5 crore rupees at 20x the valuation of what i had given it right right i've been working with the entrepreneur even yesterday evening we spent two hours together and had a drink and we were discussing what he should do next now that he's raised the capital what he should do next right so i think helping them raise capital 
and helping them sell. These are the two things that an angel investor must do. Right. The angel investor should not focus on what strategy they should adopt or what they should do in the company or all those things, right? Wherever there, if the entrepreneur needs your help, then it should be very clear, sacrosanct pull relationship. Right. Entrepreneur approaches you, I'm stuck. I have these three options. I would like to take your views, what I should do. There also, uh, I'm part of these organizations like uh, YPO and EO, right? And one of the things that I learned, which I've used extensively, in fact, one of the things we're doing for IMAI is a startup thing right. it's called Gestalt Protocol. So what it says is never advise somebody what they should do. Right. Always share an experience if you have one mm-hmm. and let them figure it out from that experience what they should do. Because if I tell you do this, and then if it doesn't do that, right, it becomes a challenge for me to accept that, you know, I told you so, it'd be very difficult to prevent myself from saying it if it fails, right? But if I've just shared an experience, right, and I've not told you what to do, right, you take my experience, or I'll take an experience of somebody who I know, and then you decide what you want to do, right? So then that's absolutely fine. So again, but it's been a learning curve, it's, it's taken me 22 investments to realize what entrepreneurs actually want from your investors and how do you prevent yourself from getting in that advice mode? <laughs> I think I always treat them as my equal or my superior. They're taking larger risks than me in life. Just because I've been successful, one doesn't give me the right to be uh, above them from a, from a strategy point of view. So sure. keep on reminding yourself that, listen, they are my equals, then it helps. And the second thing is, understand they've asked you for it. Then also share experiences, don't give any advice. So this, this, some mantras have helped me well. And today I have pretty awesome relationships with all the people I've invested in. And I think following these principles have allowed me to build up these relationships. Interesting. You know, Vivek, I know that, you know, uh, how effortlessly you put it, right? I know for a fact, it's not that easy, right? Uh, you know, I think, I think, uh, I, I understand where you're coming from, right? I think that space is very important, but you know, there are, there are many occasions, right? I mean, I've been in that position. Uh, right, but you just know that this is not something which is going to yield the right result, right? Or you're bound to hit the wall, or this is this is something which will you know land up wasting a lot of your time, which is so much more critical, right? In a founder's journey, right? Uh, and I think to still maintain that balance, right, uh, and let them operate, I think is almost godly, right? The way I put it, uh, you know, maybe we're towards the end of the conversation, right? Uh, and in the interest of time. Uh, while I would have loved this conversation to go on, uh, you know, there are very few conversations you enjoy the momentum of, right? And I think this is one such conversation. But, you know, in the interest of time, uh, you know, Vivek, uh, what are some of the key areas of interest uh, uh, that you think, you know, in a post-COVID world, right, have uh, become uh, very relevant, uh, very exciting, right? Uh, which are outside of, say, you know, the thesis that you've had, right? Uh, you know, which are outside of it, right? Which are some of these areas that you've now kind of uh, tracking, looking at, right? In the evolving uh, consumer economy. So I think basically a lot of exponential technologies that sure. are there, I think it will become very exciting. So I think if you just take AR and VR, sure. I feel the multiverse part of it, I think is going to be very exciting because I feel that, you know, there have been a lot of attempts in the past of creating virtual second life kind of uh, environments. But I think right. now is the time for it because the amount of investments Facebook has made in it. In fact, I had invested right. in this company called Chimera, uh, three, four years ago, which was in virtual reality, had had network, right. which basically failed and they gave part of my monies back. It was a company based in California. Right. But I think the time for multiverse and AR, VR has come right. to grow exponentially in the next three to five years. So uh-huh. from advertising, from media, from NFTs, everything, right? It's going to explode. Right. right. I'm actually very excited about the MarTech industry and the advertising mm-hmm. industry. There are two reasons right. for it. First reason is that in the cookie-less world, Attic and Martek is going to start playing a much more bigger reason, right. bigger role. Mm-hmm. The direct-to-consumer world, people are going to spend a lot more on advertising. Right. And as these wall gardens make their walls bigger and don't share information with each other, with Apple and Facebook and others, what's going to happen? First-party data is going to become, again, very, very critical and important. Right. If you just take the last three to four, two, three years, right? Where is Inmobi, where is SMS Gupshop, where is Netwar and all these companies, right? right? They have become so much more valuable and globally also there have been so many acquisitions. Right. The advertising market world, again, is going to go through an explosive growth. We were just lucky right. we started profit wheel at the right time. Next three to five <laughs> years is going to be very exciting for the ad tech and market world. Right. But I think 
take, right? Most of these exponential technologies, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's drones, whether it's, so any technology, right? Where one becomes two becomes four becomes eight, right? right. Most of these industries have started almost like 20, 30 years ago, right? 3D printing right. started 35 years ago. Right. So you were saying about angel investing also, right? That everything is just started, but actually not. Angel investing has been doubling every year for the last 15 years in India. Now it has reached a stage where you see that, okay, it's become one. But the one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16 right. in a period of few months, right? So in the next three years, suddenly you'll see hundreds of companies that are valued at billions of dollars. Right. Because they've been growing, doubling every quarter, every six months, every one year for the last 15 years, right? And the right. Ecosystem, whether it's the investors, whether it's the entrepreneurs, whether the team members, product developers, graphic designers, the whole ecosystem, right? So suddenly you'll see that if I wanted to hire somebody who can make a great product or right. run organizations of thousand people, I would struggle to find such people, right? Now, right. It's much easier, right? If you just take, you know, White Hat Junior, Karan took that company from zero to 6,000 people in less than uh, two and a half years. Right. So just imagine all the team, team members who are hundreds of them who have seen this growth and worked there for two and a half years. Right. Each of them can actually help you scale up an ed tech company effectively. Right. So now imagine multiply that by a flip card, multiply that by hundreds of other startups, right? right? Look at the talent availability that is there in the country. And now COVID has allowed us to hire talent. Like one, our CTO sits in Canada. Uh, one of our other guys sits in Vietnam. The other two right. guys in Bangalore. So now basically my co-founder is based in Boston. So now what has happened is <laughs> there is no need for right. talent in India, right? I can actually have talent all over the world for what kind of companies I want to build. Right. So we're sitting in this, this whole world sourcing thing. Uh, so one of the persons I respect is a guy called Nigel Morris. He used right. to be a CEO for Densu Americas and Mina. Uh -huh. running $30 billion of the business. Right. We call this concept called world sourcing, instead of off right. sourcing, right? Where you take the best guy, whoever that guy is for the task that you want to perform, can you tap into him and help? Right. So it's not about what, it's about who, right? Who can help you solve the challenge? And right. in the post-COVID world, I think you can tap into the global talent. But India itself, there is so much of talent available to create. So I think the talent is another thing. If you put it into one thing, what is the most excited I'm about the future of India is the quality of talent that is accessible to all entrepreneurs today. Right. You know. I think your excitement is contagious, Vivek. I think I think there are there are very few people. You know, typically what happens in an intellectual world, right? You typically land up into a conversation where we essentially discussing about gaps, right, and crevices and 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 inefficiencies, right. Uh, but I think I think the way you put it, right, is an extremely positive picture, right? Uh, something that we should believe in the positivity and 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 you know, the possibility of it. Right? I mean, that's 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 amazing, Vivek. Here, one last thing with you. Absolutely. I wrote a book on happiness. Right. Right? So this is getting going to the publisher next week. But their whole book, there are two fundamental premises in that. One premise right. that happiness brings you success. Right. Success does not bring you happiness. Right. And I generally believe that, you know, if you are positive towards life, positive towards, you know, if you work on happiness like a muscle, so the book is called Happiness is a Muscle, right. will make you more successful. Right. So overall, if you're authentic about, you know, so happiness is two definitions. One is like bliss and pleasure and things like that. Right. Very Western philosophy of happiness. But the other is how happy are you with the life you're leading? It is right. almost like a life satisfaction definition, right? Right. So I'm extremely happy with the life I'm leading, right? I'm extremely <laughs> happy that I've been given this life and I'm being able to live this life that I'm leading. So I think entrepreneurs, one quote that motivated me, which I'll never forget is, entrepreneurs live a few years of their life like most people won't. So they can right. live the rest of their life like most people can't. Right. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> it's because of the first Beautiful. one I sold. <laughs> so, but Beautiful. again, so life satisfaction is a very important metric of success. So right. this is my two bits about you know, I am I am itching to probe you on, on fulfillment, right? And I think that's an important, you know, step between you know being successful and happiness, right? And I think I think that feeling of fulfillment is very, very important. I think that that feeling of completeness is very important, right? I think between those extremes. But I'm going to reserve this question for, for our next conversation, Vivek. My last and very last question, right, uh, in this session, what's your uh, 
you know, one advice that you think is extremely important for a founder. And, and I think coming from you is, like I said, you know, it's very, very important and interesting because you understand both the sides, right? Uh, so what would that one advice be? So I think we are living in a, a huge, uh, uh, in a world which has a lot of opportunities. Right. I think my one advice would be build product companies. So the way I define a product company is that if you have 100 people and $100 of revenue, right. then if you want $200 of revenue, you need 200 people, you're a services company. Right. But if you build $200 of revenue with 105 people, you're a product company. The product company doesn't have to be a product. It can be a hospitality industry, uh, right. which is still a product company. So right. as long as the ratio of people to revenue is not linear, you are in a way a, a product company. And I think product companies, you can create significant amount of wealth for yourself, as well as I think uh, it is something which is easy to do it today. Early, it wasn't possible. When I was trying to build my first company, getting bunnies for product company was impossible. Now, capital is available. There are entrepreneurs who have sold their product companies who know what needs to be done. So one advice for entrepreneurs, if you do start a company, focus on building a product company. That's, that'll be great for the country as well as great for you. Rather right. than a company. Interesting. You know, Vivek, like I said, right, how I want this conversation to go on, right? So, but I think in the interest of time, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring this conversation to a close. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Uh, you know, I think every single point that you highlighted, right? I think, I think you know, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as a professional, I think I can resonate with each point, each of each of these points, right? I think it's it's not a perfect world. I think it's a it's a world which has to be sort of worked at, right? Uh, and I think things will start to sort of uh, become interesting, relevant, right? And I think, but but like you said, right? I completely concur with that. That this is the next phase of this country, right? Of our country is essentially going to be driven by entrepreneurs. The value creation is going to happen for entrepreneurs. And I think it can't be sweeter uh, than this moment, right? To take risk. Uh, Vivek, with that, I'm going to, I, I, you know, it was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. I love every bit of this conversation. Yeah, Look to have you. Thank you. Bye.